Webster University Board of, Board of Trustees in St. Louis. I'm a retired high school French teacher, and I'm a long, long time community volunteer. So that's my volunteer's claim to fame here. I first met Clark Carl thanks to the floods of 1993, and ever since our first introduction, Carl's been the go-to guide for our understanding and appreciation of St. Genevieve and his overall French story in this area. Like Thomas Jefferson, Carl's knowledge is surpassed only by his passion for this history, a passion he shares actively to nourish our work and hold us together as a community. I can only imagine what Carl and Jefferson would have texted and tweeted each other. <laughs> <laughs> to introduce Carl, I'll give a few highlights of his CV, but so many of you know it and it's so available on the internet that I'm going to do another part of my introduction on a more personal note and anecdotes of some projects that we've shared. Carl is Professor Emeritus of History at Illinois State University. He's got a BA and Master's from the University of Minnesota, a PhD from Rutgers in New Jersey, and he spent much time studying and doing academic work in Paris and maybe a little cultural work with the Bag Bagat and Fromage. <laughs> he, he has many acclaimed and influential books, which you know, on French history and the French colonial heritage in the U.S. Some of them are Stealing Indian Women, hmm. <laughs> a French aristocrat in, America, in the American West, and his latest book, St. Louis Rising, co-authored with Sharon Person, who I saw, but I, here you are, <laughs> co-authored with Sharon Person. His writings have received multiple prestigious awards. Some of his non-literary awards include um, being decorated by the French government with Les Femmes Academy from the French government for exceptional work in education. He has also received La Médaille d'Or de la Francophonie from La Renaissance Française with Ambassador Francois Delat at the Residence of France in Washington, D.C. On that occasion, we all enjoyed a glass of champagne in the company of the ambassador at the residence. Thank you, Carl, for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Examples of my personal experience with Carl, fifth graders in the flood of 93. We first met at a meeting in St. Genevieve regarding the floods of 93. The presentation inspired me to take fifth graders in the St. Louis area who were studying French down here to St. Genevieve and start them early on to learn, learning the relevance, the historic preservation, and the role of French in our area. These young students asked questions about St. Gen, the flood, the people, for the rest of the school year. The field trip was a great success for many reasons, but including Carl's introducing me to Jim Baker. And thank you, Jim. <laughs> Prince Louis de Bourbon and Carl. I took inspiration from Carl's historic expertise when Louis de Bourbon, the Duc d'Anjou, he's a direct descendant of Louis the Fifteenth, who was um, who was king when St. Louis was founded. He accepted to come to St. Louis and St. Genevieve for a week-long visit in the year of 2000. Carl gave me the confidence to lead the project, and I hope the photos are still in the St. Gen archives. Carl and Le Monde, Le Monde, you know, is the international prestigious French language newspaper. Carl, enhanced by his fluency in French, and he really, really is, he helped assure a meaningful visit here by French culture journalist Marie-Hélène Parisse, who told the story of our French heritage in an extensive article in Le Monde. And I think that was about 98, 1998. And on a book presentation at Webster University, Carl's Webster University presentation, St. Louis Rising with Sharon, attracted about 100 people, including the president of Webster University, the provost, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the national Delegé General de l'Alliance Française, that's the French government representative for the, United, for the Alliance Française in the US, he came in for it, and local French history buffs and professors. This event is still a point of pride for Webster and their Centre Francophone. In full disclosure, disclosure I am an uh, alumni of Webster, and I was profoundly grateful that Carl would come. Another event was Jefferson with Carl in Paris. 
feeding his passion for friends, feeding his passion for Jefferson, <clears throat> Carl gave a talk at the Missouri Historical Society called Hiking in Paris, uh, uh, Jefferson Hiking in Paris. Later, Carl took the time to show me this walk, and it was so meaningful as a French teacher, I kept telling all these other teachers about the experience and told them to go take a hike in Jefferson's footsteps next time they're in Paris. <laughs> and finally, the National Parks planning a meeting, which, a planning meeting, but the National Parks effort that you were all involved in, surely one way or the other. I, I was very lucky, lucky because I, the first part is Carl's role in that had to be a solid contribution to it being on track to become a national park. And Carl included me in one meeting with Tim Good. I don't know if Tim is here. He represents the national parks. And I was so grateful to be able to sit in on one of the planning sessions. So those are just some special, the tip of the iceberg of what he's done around the community and around the state to let our citizens and students know what we're doing down here. Carl's been more than generous, generous with his time and expertise, like all of you in these conferences and all that you do. I need to go get some quarry rock just to. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for indulging this more personal than academic introduction. Carl is a multi-layered guy and always responsive when asked to help out. And today's an example of Carl kindly sharing his expertise and research to the benefit of everybody in this room. So please welcome Dr. Carl Eckhart, who will present Marie Claire Catoir, a remarkable Parisian in colonial St. Genevieve. Next, thank you. Well, Jane, uh, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, you've do done so many kind things for me uh, over the last quarter of a century. Uh, most of you know that uh, the French language uh, is Jane's uh, spécialité uh, and that her natural habitat is the Alliance Française. Uh, some of you may not know that she's the distinguished past president of the National Alliance Française. So thank you so much, Jane, for that uh, fulsome uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about three women today, uh, uh, the first of whom is as uh, Pia. Uh, and uh, here is a song that she recorded, part of the song that she recorded uh, in 1960. Uh, and she dedicated this recording uh, to the French Foreign Legion. Now, I don't know how many of you know about French history circa 1960, but to do that was virtually treasonous uh, because the goal had just decided to, to sever French uh, relations with, with Algeria. It was no longer going to be Algérie Française. Uh, in any case, these three women, totally disparate kinds of personalities from different centuries, uh, three, uh, these three women, including Edith Piaf, uh, had many things in common. They were all French. Uh, they were all Parisians. Uh, they were all from the East End, that is to say, the, the poorer side of Paris. Uh, they were all French nationalists, and they were all absolutely persuaded in the superiority uh, of French civilization. Uh, so here is uh, our, here is her song. Bob, do we have that device? Yeah. Bob's gonna. Bob's gonna, gonna do some. We're gonna try to do some low music low with, that, with, the, with the, with the lyrics Bob, here. Can you Spend a whole rainy afternoon on the music <laughs> listening to this wonderful one. Make me want to cry. Yes. Uh, 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 basically, what she's saying here, by the way, Jane did a very elegant translation of, of these uh, lines, and they're available. Did you, where'd you place those? Uh, they're on the table, but it's not my translation. I looked at a bunch and picked the best. I, you know, every translation of a song has its own tone, but there are English translations on the table. Uh, 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 Jane warned me about this, but that, uh, let me summarize this. She's saying, that's all I'm getting out. <laughs> okay, so 
now uh, we're coming uh, eventually to Paris, uh, to the to old Paris. Uh, but let me tell a, a quick story that uh, happened to me half a century ago. Uh, half a century ago to the day I was living uh, out uh, near the Place de la Nation uh, in Paris. Uh, and I went to, exactly, that's right, it's exactly half a century ago. Uh, and I went to the post office uh, to send a package and there was a line at the guichet. What do you call that? The window, huh? Uh, there was a line uh, and there was a guy who was uh, uh, pretty clearly an Algerian at the window. Uh, and the clerk uh, was hassling this guy, saying, I can't understand your French. What are you trying to say? And blah, blah, blah. And this went on and on and on. And finally, the woman in front of me, this is the second woman after Pia, the woman got out of the line. She said, you dog, <laughs> to, the, to the guy behind the, you know, the guy behind the window. You salaud. Uh, this man is an honorable citizen of France. You are a servant of the French state. You will serve him now. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm not sure that would happen today, but uh, uh, there's a certain kind of, in other words, she's a French nationalist. Huh? This guy's become a French citizen. Doesn't make a difference whether he's Algerian originally. Huh? It was a uh, yeah, totally remarkable uh, scene for me. Uh, okay, so now we are moving to this uh, this place with a strange name, the Hôpital Général de la Salpêtrière. And to try to explain that name would take my full time here. So let's just say it's kind of a strange name. Uh, it's out now in the 13th uh, arrondissement. There's a Seine flowing this way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a well-known institution in Paris. It, uh, see if we can, so, this is where the third woman started her, her life for us, the Salpetriere. It is out here, uh, and it is now part of the uh, national uh, uh, French healthcare system, a distinguished uh, teaching hospital. Uh, but it was something totally uh, different. Uh, here is the gate as it looks today, designed by Louis Lebeau, uh, who also worked on Versailles. Uh, and this uh, uh, Salpetriere uh, was a place where there were uh, uh, orphans, uh, there were mentally disturbed people, uh, there were petty thieves, uh, there were lots and lots of prostitutes. And by the way, some of them, uh, uh, some of the people here met all four categories. <laughs> they were uh, they were all of the above. Uh, Marie Claire, I think, uh, was not was simply uh, probably uh, an orphan. Uh, we don't know. Uh, for sure. Uh, so it was a place uh, with a lot of ugliness, but with distinguished architecture. Once again, it's, you know, it, it's a distinguished hospital today. Out here. Okay, so uh, here is, uh, it was famous. Here is a load of prostitutes being taken uh, to that institution. Okay, now we come to this question of the filles du roi, the king's daughters. Very famous in Canada, less famous uh, in Louisiana. Uh, my understanding is that this uh, phrase, les filles du roi, was not in fact used at the time. That the phrase, that this is the king's daughters literally, that the phrase, phrase was les pupilles du roi. Uh, how would you translate that? Jane, the wards? The wards. Because pupil the came from it. The word pupil came right. from it. It's in that same land. It's, it's, it's in the same thing. I would, I would translate it as the wards of the king, mm -hmm. which is more accurate than this. Uh, in any case, they're very famous in Canada. And maybe someone here has this statistic. I got it from one of the ladies in Michigan. I think that 70% of French Canadians today uh, <laughs> have blood from les filles du roi. That is to say, these wards of the king who were being sent uh, to North America to help increase the population. So very well known in Canada, uh, less, much less well known uh, in Louisiana. Uh, in fact, they do reenactments in, in the St. Lawrence River of the arrival of Les Filles du Roi uh, in Quebec City. Huh? Very famous. 
Okay, so here uh, is the first document that identifies uh, Marie Claire Tacroi. Uh, and this talks about uh, the, here they say, they say, Les Filles de la Maison de Saint Louis de la Salpetrière, huh? uh, June 1720, uh, and they, they are being uh, sent to the seaport of Pembroke, uh, which is on the estuary of the Loire River. And so now, how, exactly how this happened, I don't know, but it seems to me uh, that these were volunteers. That is to say, someday in June of 1720, uh, at the Salpetrière, they assembled all of the females, as, as one commenter said, quelques femmes and quelques filles. Some virgins, some not. Uh, they assembled them in the courtyard of the Salpetrière and say, who would like to go to the land of milk and honey? Louisiana. And Marie Claire Tatoir raised her hand, uh, and they were sent off in the fall of 1720 for the seaport of Pambeau. There is her name on the list. Marie Claire Tatois. Very likely an orphan, family from the east side of Paris. Uh, by the way, I think we have, a, you know, I don't have a real long presentation. If you want to interrupt me, please do. There's no problem. If you, if you have a question, uh, please do interrupt. How, how old was she? Do you know? Or is it showing on that case? Sharon? Born 1701, we don't know. All we know is that, all, all we have is her death record from St. Genevieve, her, her burial record from St. Genevieve from, uh, from uh, 1773, and I think it says she was 72. We're gonna look at that death record, so, so we can kind of figure this out. This burial record, I shouldn't say death record, burial record. I heard that the king gave them dowry Uh, I think that that was true for the Canadians. I'm not sure about Louisiana. It, it's, it's really remarkable. These filles du two filles du bois, are much studied in Canada, very little studied in Louisiana. Okay, so here she is. Uh, uh, took the trip then, I don't know how, in the fall of, of 1720, uh, from Paris uh, down to the estuary of the Loire, uh, Loire, Loire River uh, to take ship for Louisiana. Uh, the ship was the whale, uh, La Vallée. So, sailed over. Uh, I haven't been able to pin this down. Uh, almost all ships uh, coming from France to Louisiana uh, stopped at Saint-Domingue on the way before they went to the Gulf Coast, but I haven't been able to determine whether the ship, uh, the La Valine, did it on this trip uh, during, actually during the winter of 1720-1721. So they arrived, uh, not in newly found in New Orleans, uh, but they arrived, uh, not at Mobile either, but they arrived right here on this island, which is still called Ship Island, it's called Ship Island on the French map, they arrived here and went inland at, at Biloxi uh, in January 1721. So we're, we're tracing her, her steps from L'Hôpital Général de la Salpetrière uh, across the ocean uh, to Louisiana uh, and eventually up to this neck of the woods. Let me stop. Any, any questions about this? How long would the journey have taken? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and it varied so much depending on the weather. Probably a couple of months to get from the estuary of the Loire uh, to Biloxi at that time. Here's what Biloxi looked like. You can see that. It was more a campground than a, than a, than a village. But she did get married there uh, in 1721. Uh, to a guy who becomes a pretty important person, though she's ultimately more important, named Leonard Guillaume, uh, who was a Canadian. I was just discussing this with Sharon. We don't know for sure how Leonard, maybe you could answer this, Sally. Uh, we, it's possible, we think, that he arrived on the Gulf Coast from Canada via the water. 
We don't know whether he was in Kaskaskia before he shows up to marry Marie Claire in 1721 in Biloxi. Interesting question. Huh? How old was he? How old was Leonard? I don't know. Uh, Sharon might know that. <laughs> Leonard? I'm just going to touch Sharon. I, I got, my notes are in the trunk of my car. <laughs> 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 I was just wondering if showed up as a witness in a baptism of Jean Lafayette. Uh, he Are died you? much earlier than Marie Claire, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was uh, uh, that he was cascade. all that much older. Right. No, I, I don't believe I did ever see him. Right. Yeah. By the way, his nickname was La Fati. Difficult to translate that. Leonard Villon de la Fatigue. What on earth does that mean? The indefinable one? The tireless one? The fastidious one? Very, very difficult to translate that nickname. Uh, but it was very commonly used. It's not used here. So this is their, their marriage record from the spring of 1721. They then. No, there wasn't. There, it was a mission chapel. There wasn't any parish there. This is a copy of the original. Uh, it's a copy of the original, and it is in the uh, uh, New Orleans parish records. Any other questions here? Once again, please interrupt me when you have a question. Uh, so this is New Orleans at about that time. Uh, you know, it's a newly founded place. Uh, many ships coming from France didn't try to get to New Orleans uh, in the early 1720s. Uh, they would go to Biloxi or they would go to Mobile. Uh, you know, getting up the estuary of the Mississippi was difficult. But in any case, once they left Biloxi, that is to say, Léonard and Marie Claire Cartoir, they would have come via New Orleans uh, before heading up the Mississippi River. Uh, so by this time, remember New Orleans, quote, found in 1718, uh, that it had become the entrepôt uh, for the entire Mississippi River Valley by the time that uh, Marie Claire and Leonard were there. Okay, so uh, they arrived in Kaskaskia. Many of you are familiar with this map. St. Genevieve shouldn't be there in the 1720s, or even in the 1730s, right, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in any case, uh, there, we, there we have Kaskaskia, and they arrive in Kaskaskia. The earliest we can pin them down there is uh, that's why I'm thinking that Leonard may have come from Canada uh, because they, they marry in the spring of 1721 in Biloxi and they don't show up in Kaskaskia until I think it was February 1723. So what's going on here? I don't know, this is speculation. Here's, here's a blind spot, 1721, 1723, we don't know. She may have had her first child there, right? Cheryl, uh, Sharon's been, been digging, digging, digging into this uh, census of 1725, 1726, which they are on. And that first child may have been born down on the Gulf Coast. Okay, let's, let's move along here before I get uh, deep through too much. Uh, so here is the fabulous, in our opinion, fabulous 1732 census uh, of uh, Kaskaskia, uh, and it shows the family here. In fact, here the nickname is being used. Instead of the surname Biaron, the nickname La Fati is being used on the census. Uh, that nickname would have been used by by Louis Saint Ange, by Robert Bolton Saint Ange, who uh, was the commandant. The census. Let me not get tangled up in too much. <laughs> the, 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 the census was was taken by the commandant from Fort de Chart. Uh, in 1732. In any case, uh, the significant thing here uh, is that they already have five children by 1732. Five children, and they're listed in the column of legitimate children. There are, there are some bastard kids here, too. They call them enfants bâtards, uh, listed here. Uh, and here it shows uh, that they already have one black slave and one Indian slave. Uh, so this would suggest that they are a property of some substance uh, in Kaskaskia by 1732. We're going to come back to the issue of Marie Claire and her slaves here uh, as we move along. Any questions? Why Kaskaskia? Why not somewhere else? Why did they? Why Kaskaskia? Uh, 
probably more likely than not, uh, Léonard Biron had established himself in, uh, as a French Canadian, in, which was a French Canadian community, had established himself there before he went down to the Gulf Coast to marry Marie Claire. Uh, but Kaskaskia, if we may use this kind of a word, was the metropole of the Illinois country of Upper Louisiana. It was the largest community, larger than, than where the fort was, which was up the river side. But Kaskaskia was, the, in fact, Kaskaskia, Mac, where are you? Kaskaskia was the largest place in Upper Louisiana for 100 years. Absolutely. Yeah, for the whole 18th century, Kaskaskia. Uh, Mac, uh, uh, McDonald here is, uh, just about to come up with a great book on Kaskaskia. Uh, so here, uh, by the way, the birth, the birth, yeah, these are their five children. Uh, five children. This is absolutely, totally remarkable. Many things remarkable. First of all, that, that Marie Claire Capoir bears five children in a 10 year period, all of whom live to maturity. That's virtual, that's just, that's crazy. That did not happen uh, in 18th century uh, Louisiana. Another one, by the way, this is based on Sharon's work. Uh, that is, uh, this is Sharon's uh, uh, analysis of the family from the 1732 census. Okay? Uh, uh, another remarkable thing about this is that, check me if I'm wrong here, Sharon, that though we know these five children were born at about that time, there's not a single baptismal record for these children. Now that's also a very, very strange thing because we do have lots and lots and lots of baptismal records uh, from this uh, time period. Okay, now of these children, we have to say, notice the second from the bottom, she is overwhelmingly the most important of these five children because notice who she married. Well, that way. So the brothers, the four brothers, are insignificant compared to the Marianne because she marries them. She marries, she marries the, the wealthiest guy in Upper Louisiana. Uh, and something that she brought into the marriage was that she was literate. Uh, Marianne had been taught to read and write by her mother, Marie Claire Tatois, the orphan from the east end of Paris. How did she learn to read and write, though? Do you think she was under that obligation? How did Marie Claire? Yeah. Uh, she came from a literate family in Paris. She was an orphan, <coughs> but she was literate. And this was kind of rare. I mean, we might note, you know, this was, you know, Francois Ballet, she taught him how to sign ballet. We can tell that from the writing. But that's all he ever wrote. Uh, he couldn't even write Francois. He was he was uh, functionally illiterate. But the wealthiest man, and for a period of time, the most powerful man in Upper Louisiana. Okay, so here is her signature. Uh, uh, her husband died. Leonard died. Seventeen. Where were you? Thirty-eight was it? Yeah, he died young. <laughs> Her husband died early. Send me an email next time you read me a poem. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I thought I remembered all this. And then we were up late drinking last night. <laughs> I can't remember these things, you know? You know? I'm an octogenarian, Sharon. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, okay, so here is her signature. Uh, and why she consistently, uh, she's literate, mind you, but she consistently uh, misspells widow, verb. She leaves out uh, a letter there in verb. But uh, she is calling herself uh, the widow Biahon. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, the document by the Jesuit priest Aubert uh, says that uh, uh, he spells it out. Marie Claire Biahon, verb, spelled correctly, you know, uh, La Patie. Huh? So he does. Uh, kind of does, uh, the priest did the, the whole nine yards. Huh? And here, here is her, this is her handwriting. Uh, 
which is one of the most interesting documents, if I may say so, Bob, maybe the most interesting document in the St. Uh, Genevieve uh, civil records. And so here, uh, she spells it out, once again, misspelling. Why, is, is there some way that that word will be pronounced, verb, that would, that would legitimize her misspelling of it? I can't quite figure that out, because she, she pretty good spelling. Marie Claire Tapper, she is the, the widow, the verb, the Léonard Guillermont, and she leaves off the, the La Fatigue. So sometimes they added the nickname, uh, and sometimes they didn't. By this time, by the way, she's living in St. Genevieve. So we, we really have four lives for her. Life in Paris, Hôpital General de Ressortes-Pétrière, mm -hmm. life on the Gulf Coast, life in Kaskaskia, life in St. Genevieve. And we can follow her. You know, there are some blank spots, like 1721, 23, but it's amazing the detail with which we can follow her life. And she lived a long time. Yes, please. Well, this actually kind of goes back to his arrival on the Gulf Coast. Is there some way that people knew, people who wanted French wives knew that there would be boats from Paris with possible white material on them? <laughs> Saint-Domingue uh, on the way over, uh, there were uh, some, some smaller, faster ships between Saint-Domingue and the Gulf Coast, uh, word would have gotten out. Uh, my suspicion is that Leonard knew that La Baline was, was going to be arriving at Biloxi uh, and made it a point to be there. He was looking for a wife, no doubt about that. Yes, please, tell me. If the ship stopped at Saint-Domingue, is it possible that Prostitutes got off there and the others came to Biloxi? <laughs> or vice versa? <laughs> 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 Saint Domingue was known for the prostitutes. You know, it's interesting. With all the details we have on her travels from Paris, Estuary of the Loire, the Loire what was that, to the Gulf Coast, we just don't know. Just, I mean, what wonderful to know that. I think there is usually a couple of fun nuns, but there is a letter from one of the um, managers of the commissary up, I think it's the Fort de Sharp one. Um, they knew. Yes. He, he knew. He was asking right. for a better quality of women, is the kind of what he said. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, there was the issue because there was a lot of venereal disease in, in the, uh, the, the, the Sautetriere. So what are we gonna say? But it, it seems pretty, uh, pretty evident that Marie Claire was not afflicted with any venereal disease. She has five children in a 10 year period and they all live to maturity. That's an amazing sign of robust health. Okay, so uh, here is the daughter, the important daughter married to Francois Ballet, uh, over here, uh, and here uh, is her son, uh, Charles Ballet, uh, the older brother of Francois. Uh, and you can kind of tell that she is the one, that is to say, Marie Claire taught her daughter, Marianne, how to write. And Marianne uh, teaches her sons how to write. And she does it because her husband ain't gonna do it because he can't write. <laughs> Francois Ballet, huh? So looking at these signatures, a wife of, of, of Leonard Guillaume, her son, Charles. So, uh, uh, Indian slave marriage, uh, the, the the bridegroom is Joseph, and the bride is Suzanne, uh, and that they are the Christian uh, uh, slaves of Léonard Guillaume, that is to say, the son of Marie Claire. Uh, and here is 
while he declared as a witness to this slave, Indian slave marriage uh, in Kaskaskia in 1758. Uh, and here she is identified as uh, Claire Patois, widow of Leonard Dion, as one of the witnesses at this Indian slave marriage. Uh, and notice that they are identified as Christian Indians. Chrétien esclave. Okay, now these slaves uh, go from the son uh, to the mother when they move to St. Genevieve. That is to say, Leonard Jr. here uh, gives them to uh, his mother. Okay, now uh, here is uh, the the, uh, uh, the, I think this is the best of the, of the, uh, of the uh, St. Genevieve religious records, as opposed to the civil records, the religious records being done uh, in the church. Uh, and this is a baptismal record uh, for a child of those two Indian slaves, the legitimate marriage of Joseph and Suzanne. Uh, Indians, sauvage, not a pejorative term. Absolutely not a pejorative term. Simply meaning Indians. And the priest, who was Mervin, the, uh, one of the, the last of the Jesuits at Kaskaskia, then in St. Genevieve, then in St. Louis. Uh, and they're identified as, as Sauvage. And the priest, Mervin, writes Esclave. Sauvage Esclave. He then scratches that out. This is wonderful. You can, you can see the priest at work here, you know. Uh, and then he writes, instead of sauvage, instead of sauvage esclave, sauvage adopté. Adopted. They're no longer slaves. They have been adopted by Dame Diamon de la Pati. So these have become kind of her children. They're no longer slaves. And it's interesting that this kind of grand name is used. It's not just a, a Marie Claire, it's Dame Biahon de la Patie. That, that, that gives some sense of her status. Uh, and at this time, I'm thinking that she is the grandest woman in St. Genevieve. She's the mother-in-law to, by far and away, the most powerful guy, Francois Vallée. Uh, and she is mother to Marianne, who becomes a kind of diplomat for Francois Vallée, working between uh, St. Genevieve and, and St. Louis, the commandant there. So she's, you know, she's a hugely important person, and she's, you know, she's no, she's no youngster at this point. Isn't this a, now Bob, you gotta admit, Bob's a connoisseur of these documents. And this one where you can watch the, the priest scratching out the name, uh, uh, making these Indians her children rather than her slave. Yeah. To me, that's just, you know, it's, it's the reason we get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> this is the most interesting, uh, both documents pertaining to Marie Claire Viron de la Batie. This is the most interesting document in the civil records in St. Genevieve. First was religious, uh, and here is the civil record. Uh, and here, uh, this is in her handwriting. This is all in her handwriting. It's a legal document, the original of which is in the courthouse in St. Genevieve. I mean, I mean, hell with the vertical log houses. Here's the real stuff. <laughs> uh, so she says, the undersigned, and she that identifies herself uh, Marie Claire Catois. Here she spells Beuve. Is that better? I, I can't see it right now. Widow Leonard Guiron uh, uh, declares, declares that her slave Susan has been freed, uh, that, that, uh, that she is freed. Uh, and she was a, a sauvagesse, using the feminine form of sauvage. Once again, not, pre, not pejorative. Uh, she was a Pawnee, well that doesn't mean anything. She said she's from the Pawnee tribe. Uh, and that she is marrying, Suzanne is marrying the other Indian slave, Joseph, 
who has already been freed. Okay, so remember that they that they have their child. The, their their child is you know, uh, their their Christian slaves. They have a child. They get married. The, these two slaves who are really no longer slaves are the children uh, of Marie Claire Chakwar uh, de La Fati. And then she says they will serve her, and that after her death, uh, that they will that they will continue to conserve their lives as French people. Here we come to this French nationalism where there even was a French nation, it was the French realm. She's saying she wants, them, she wants them to be free, but she wants them to live as French people, and she wants them to profess the religion Catholic and Roman, and to comport themselves as good free people of the French nation. This is amazing stuff for the, for the pre-revolutionary period. This is 1768. To comport themselves as good, free people of the French nation. What? <laughs> I've never seen any language like that in a, in a pre-French Revolution uh, document. Huh? Just one, Bob? Good. Yeah, we shouldn't say that. <laughs> we shouldn't say that. It's just no. It's in her hand. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is she distancing them from the horrid people on the other side of the river? She is. Uh, she is making. She is. Uh, she wrote that document to make sure that everyone understood that these two Indians in her household were free people. So it's a kind of certificate of freedom. As long as they behave like good French people. <laughs> that would be important. That would be important. And Carl? Just. Thank you, Madge. And she knew also that the British had acquired all the property. Well, she would have east, known that. Yeah. East side yeah. of the river. So yeah, she, she would have. Sure they're friends. Yeah, good point. Good yeah. point, yeah. Emily. Yeah, she would surely have known that. Yeah, indeed. Yes, please. So, Carl, they're, they're free and they're, they're called servants. So, are they paid or they just live in the household or do we have any, any sense? They're her children. Okay. So, they're adopted. Oh, they're children. So, they're, they're adopted. Right adopted. Yeah. yeah. They're her children. So, but they're married, right? They're married, yeah. 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 Indeed. And they're Christians. That's all it, uh, when they were getting married. A necessity for getting married to the Roman Catholic Church. You know, they have to be Christians and Roman Catholic, right? Yeah. They would have legally had the right to marry. Right, which was what was that transition? Right. 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 This is all well and good, madam, but I'm a Muslim. <laughs> she says they got to behave like good French people, but they also got to be good Roman Catholics because she, she, they're the same thing at that period of time for someone like her. I mean, that the, the, the Roman Catholic religion is an integral part. Marie Claire wasn't any wild Protestant. <laughs> So uh, here is uh, 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 an unfortunate uh, 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 burial record for her. Unfortunate in the sense that the, 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 the visiting priest, Valentin, uh, come down from St. Louis uh, in uh, 1773, didn't really know her when he buried her. Uh, and he is spelling her last name, Dihon. And so, you know, the difference between the real name, Dihon, and D. Home is, is, you know, the last name is, is woefully misspelled here. It sounds almost the same, D. Home and D. Home, but it's, it's, it's not. Uh, so here is 1773, and this is, oh, she's of, of about, she's about 62 years old. So, I'm sorry, so, 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 yeah, 72. So she's born about 1701. I think that's the best we can do on that age, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so finally, uh, in her uh, estate inventory, you know, they compulsively did inventories, uh, here is an item that caught my eye, uh, an old skirt, uh, copy say, serge, I think you pronounce that, that's the fabric, an old skirt, uh, and an old, uh, and an old cotton, an old, an old cloth of, of, uh, of cotton. And I like to think uh, that these two items of clothing were the clothing that she, uh, the clothing that she was wearing when she walked out of La Salpetriere in 1720 and said, "I'm getting on that ship." Oh, I'm getting on. <laughs> Thank you very much. persisted or not. They had a child. I don't know. I'm looking around for a <laughs> I don't know. Can't answer. I'm sorry. But what they he, uh, Joseph did have a surname of sorts. A curious surname. I don't know. You know. Uh, she's identified as being from the Pawnee tribe. Uh, his tribal affiliation is not given. So, And Pawnee was so generic that it's difficult. Very, very. Yeah, very, very difficult. Yes, please. There was a musical written uh, called Naughty Marietta, and supposedly that story is about a French, young French girl who comes over to Louisiana. And, uh, that is story. a, a parents who did Did you find three of the women on that same ship that, that eventually wound up in Illinois, in Kaskaskia? Uh, For the arrival of La Balie off the coast of Biloxi in January 1721, there seemed to have been three guys from Kaskaskia who were there looking for, for what was your nice wife expression? Material. Wife material. <laughs> your phrase, not mine. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>